organization in contributing further to uh, increasing uh, the democratic participation, to make sure that no one is left behind. And if you can share with all of us some examples, and maybe this can be inspiring for um, other partners to, to follow your lead. Sure, absolutely. And uh, we're proud that one of our partners are the people of Moldova and organizations within Moldova, because as you said, we believe that democracy is the winning edge. And when we talk about technology, that's actually still a hard uh, issue for us to, to acknowledge. It still tends to be that human rights and democracy come second to commerce, come second to markets. The problem is, is that approach hasn't worked. Right? We've allowed an unfettered, very laissez-faire approach to this without respect for human rights and democracy at the, at the forefront. Um, and this is where we are. This is the high watermark that we, sitting here in Europe and in the United States, are experiencing. NDI is operating around the world, uh, mostly, uh, uh, exclusively in the majority world. Um, our colleagues at Freedom House will tell us yet again this year that the digital space in the Freedom on the Net report, that the digital space continues to close, democracy continues to be under threat, and uh, it's getting more difficult for democracy activists around the world to, uh, to operate. Um, I'll share with you just a few things that we've noticed and kind of some big trends and then some examples uh, that, that we've come to understand. Uh, one is that when it comes to tech companies, it's very uneven. The access that we have sitting here is not the norm. Um, and it's not, uh, it, it is, it is uh, it comes often that our partners are asking us, can you get us on the phone with these big companies? We have to tell them what we're experiencing. And the questions are challenging. We're talking about dialects in Tunisian. We're talking about, uh, you know, ethnic challenges, uh, political parties that are so small in smaller countries that they may not meet certain thresholds. Um, we're talking about, I was talking with my colleague about uh, uh, Google's AdSense. You can't access it in uh, uh, Albanian, uh, the, in Kosovo, uh, Montenegro, and North Macedonia, meaning like Rita Ora's like home country can't access and look at her videos on YouTube. Um, and she can't monetize um, in, in these places. That's been going on for months, and yet they can't get a phone call returned to deal with it. Um, so we're trying to help them. Um, but it's not just tech companies. That's often our last stop. We also see that governments simply aren't meeting the challenge. Um, we work a lot with political parties and legislatures, and I'll give you an example here of what uh, we're working on quite a bit in an issue dear to my heart, which is uh, uh, technology-facilitated gender-based violence. This is the number one threat to democracy around the world. The fact that women are attacked for how they look and uh, their appearance and who they are, and not for the issues they represent. It's the number one reason that women choose not to run for office in every country in which we operate. Um, it's also a very difficult challenge for tech companies. Um, for a lot of reasons, because of cultural challenges and other things. Yeah. But political parties haven't stepped up either. Uh, neither have parliaments and judicial systems to make this admissible in court. So we have a lot of work to do there. Finally, I want to raise one other issue that we haven't sort of gotten to yet, which is that we've talked a lot about the application layer and the challenges of disinformation. But this year is actually pivotal for the attacks that we're seeing from Russia and China on a more systemic level of the internet itself, the free and open internet. Um, we're seeing that in the Global Digital Compact, which is playing out right now, um, where you have basic fundamental human rights being undermined within that document, going into the WISIS forum uh, and the realignment of what we call the multi-stakeholder framework, the ability of companies, civil society, and governments to work together. There are governments out there, not just a few. We're talking about the entire G77 that are saying, nope, we only want governments making decisions. We don't want the people who invented the internet, the people who spend most of their time on the internet, and the people administering the internet to help us make the rules. We only want governments to make the rules. Mm -hmm. 
I personally think that's a terrible idea, but what's happening is those of us who live and operate in this space aren't aware of those dynamics happening. We're not paying close enough attention, mm -hmm. and we have the problem that we could fundamentally lose the democratic nature of the internet in and of itself. So I'll stop there. No. Uh, f first of all, I just realized with uh, Moira's remarks, like how wide and intricate uh, and complex is the conversation we are having. And you know, dear participants, we are soon to be starting the Q and A session. So please, because there were so many interesting points, valid points uh, explored by our panelists. So please, if you want to follow up on a specific one, please think about the question. Uh, please mind to introduce yourself first and the organization you represent. Uh, but you know, just a quick follow up before we start the Q and A. Uh, like Moira, you've mentioned um, an element which I think is uh, central. You've identified that one of the main problems uh, currently is like gender-based violence. Uh, how do you see it can be tackled jointly? Like, what could be a solution you would propose, uh, based from your experience, that you know all of us should be thinking um, around uh, right now? Well, the good news is we are seeing progress. I was happy uh, a few years ago to help the White House launch the Global Partnership to End Online Harassment and Abuse um, Against Women. It's a terrible acronym. We just call it the Global Partnership of, of like-minded governments who are addressing this. And we've brought them together in the context of looking at women within the context of elections, both as candidates but also election officials. Uh, in Kenya, and through that, uh, and through the experiences of the women who experience this, we have developed a list of interventions. Again, what we're seeing is, yes, it's tech companies. We need tech companies at the table to help address not just the content, but the activities, so brigading, um, other, other tactics that we see uh, nefarious actors use. But we also need um, uh, political parties. One of, one of the things we've noticed, for instance, the number one group that begins attacking women are their own political party. Not even the uh, opposing political party, but their political party. When women begin to rise up and, and have power, um, they will face opposition. Um, and uh, so within that, then, the institutions of, of power, uh, parliaments putting in codes of conduct, codes of conduct around elections. Um, as well as uh, expanding it to look at, you know, uh, the whole of society. I'll offer, you know, we often look to the EU as an example. I would highlight for any of you who haven't checked out the eSafety Commission in Australia, it's really a, a, such a fascinating and such a wonderful uh, service. Um, they're a regulatory body that's there regulating on behalf of the people, and the e-safety mechanisms they've put in place have allowed for greater reporting, greater transparency, greater accountability, um, and you know it just goes to show that we can have the internet we want, uh, we can have the digital experience we want, we can make it available to all people, but we shouldn't delude ourselves to think that it's just going to happen. Uh, because of market forces and because of government's well-intentioned. Uh, people have to be at the center of that, and we have to demand transparency, accountability, and all of these issues that uh, we've talked about here. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Moira. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Emilia. Uh, thank you, Sirpa. Thank you, Nikolai. Thank you, Nicholas, for laying down these wonderful introductory remarks. Now it's my great pleasure to be turning to our uh, uh, youth fellow, the one who is representing a, a, a number of young delegates here at the, uh, at the conference. So, David, you've heard the participants today, and you have the privilege, and again, like no pressure on you, but there is, everyone is watching. Uh, what would be the first question to start with? Like, what was for you uh, particularly interesting during the session? First of all, thank you very much for your excellent moderation and all the distinguished uh, speakers for your insights and the organizers for giving me a hat I've never worn before, that of a keynote listener, <laughs> which I had to Google to properly understand what my, my responsibilities get are. Get it on your CV. Uh, yes. You're going to get hired immediately. In, indeed, indeed. But I did listen, exactly as the role says, and I wanted to touch upon two topics. One is AI and the other one is media literacy. Uh, and to give you a bit of background, I'm originally Romanian, so neighboring country also in the region, um, and I'm based in Brussels. But what I've been doing for the past eight to ten years is reskilling people of all ages, in particular young people, and equipping them with both people skills and digital skills. And what I've noticed since 2022, uh, since the launch of ChatGPT, is something that is both exciting as a techie, as I myself a techie, I used to work for a big tech company, 
and I deliver now prompt engineering trainings, but what I find quite worrying for our democracy is that uh, prompt engineering and, and tools like ChatGPT and others, especially if used at the young age, and maybe some of you here have children, uh, maybe children going to school, uh, either now in September or in the next year, they started using it a lot, young people, who are very digitally savvy from basically the day they're born uh, nowadays. And my worry is that at the foundation of democracy is people, and people with good critical thinking. So my worry is that in the age of generative AI, in which it's easy to, 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 to get the homework done for you, to write an essay for you, what will that do to our children's capacity to critically think? And I don't want, if possible, to, to, to ask you the question of how you'd answer it on behalf of your organization, because I think often at BLED and other similar forums, we discussed a lot at the macro level, what, what organizations can do, what governments can do. But I'm curious, what do you do for your children and your maybe uh, members of, of the community, younger members, to make sure that the, the critical thinking muscles they have continue to be worked in the age of generative AI, in which the solution is a click away? So I, I Thank can you. come right back at this, because obviously the, the, uh, this hit uh, universities like a bombshell, yeah. when suddenly a student can put a, e even a quite um, class course specific uh, prompt into uh, chat GPT and get a B answer. So if any student can just put in the prompt and get a B in your class, so I thought, what do we do about this? And what I did is I required students to do it and then graded them on the commentary on where the, how the chat GPT answer fell short. So they're graded on what they can do better than chat GPT. Oh, and smart. many students felt, thank you. <laughs> that's never happened before that somebody clapped an assessment. But uh, the, the underlying problem was that at USC, where the students are supposedly some of the smartest in, in America, none of them understood why professors gave assignments. They said, isn't it so that you can check we've done the reading? And I said, OK, let, imagine I'm a coach. You're co and I'm coaching you for a marathon, right? I ask you to run. Now, there is a technology called a bus, which allows you to get across the same distance. Would it be a good idea to take the bus? And they said, of course not, because the run is to try and increase our capacity. I said, that's why I'm assigning an um, assignment to you at the midpoint in the class. And it was, they really hadn't thought about the whole business of why they are given assignments. So having, making it clear and reminding people why they're doing it in the first place is essential. And I, I think that we've become kind of ritualized. We're, we're not really thinking about the purpose of some of the um, uh, requirements of education. and. Similarly, in, in a family context, you maybe haven't talked to your kids about why you need to do this, why you need to develop the capacity, and what you're able to do at the end of a process where you have incrementally developed those capacities. And sometimes you need really corny metaphors, like talking about a movie like The Karate Kid or Professor X and his mutants. But there'll be something that registers with the students that turns on a light, or the kids that turns on a light bulb, and where it becomes something where they can see why it's good for them. So you can empower them to make a, a smarter choice in their own cultural terms. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. But still, I think most of the people will get the bus uh, to get to the school. <laughs> so uh, if, uh, dear panelists, you could comment shortly on David's question, because it was for everyone. Uh, if you can keep it short in your remarks. Let's go with Nikolai, please. Um, quickly, um, congrats, David, on the first great question as a keynote listener. Um, I think if I, if I, it's, it's such an ambitious question, right? It's such a broad question. If I just look more narrowly at the context of youth education around Gen AI in the context of democratic challenges and elections specifically, I'm actually thinking of recent Slovak elections and how we worked pretty closely with CSOs to actually educate young voters to basically encourage voting in the first place, but then also to um, help them identify disinformation. And I think naturally, as technology evolves, we will also want to include some Gen AI 
you know, recognition, challenges uh, in that kind of education process. Uh, I do want to maybe uh, add, um, I do want to add that maybe six or 12 months ago, if we had been asked, all of us collectively, how much of a disruption is Gen AI going to be in the um, democratic process, we would probably have all raised our hands to say it's going to be catastrophic, right? And not to diminish the impact of Gen AI on these de democratic uh, challenges, I think we're pleasantly surprised that it's not been that systemic level of presence on all you know, platforms and media. So, and I think it's interesting to note that, and I think we need to keep pushing. You know, for example, labeling Gen AI generated altered content to make sure people can actually see that it's coming from a Gen AI tool, whichever platform it is. Um, and or then- And still count the fingers. It's still away. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's right. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> but, but and, and then also making sure that all of our, um, you know, content moderation practices, policies across platforms are applied the same way to Gen AI content as it is to normal content. Yeah, let me jump quickly to Moira and then go back. Uh, you wanted to follow up. I just that. want to second that, that uh, we've recently done some research, and, and this is also an apology to all of you. We really identified this uh, being the year of elections because of the volume of people that are voting around the world. And then this thing called ChatGPT came along, and we all did lots of panels like this to talk about the convergence of AI and elections. But that is really, it was a convergence. It wasn't necessarily a, you know, this is going to change everything because the, the thing that we still see as the major threat to democracy around the world and elections in particular are the attacks on our institutions and not generative AI, right? The attacks online of election commissions, of the validity of elections, of all of those different uh, factors, that's the fundamental problem that we're facing. Yeah, for democratic institutions. Yeah, thank you. Serpa, back to you. Thank you, a little bit different angle. Uh, uh, and not with my fra hat. Uh, I, I spent 12 years in the Finnish parliament before I took this job and followed very closely uh, what was happening in Finland. Finland has had a very good education system, quite known for it, and I think it's part of our resilience. But it didn't have the uh, sort of uh, preparedness to deal with the, the rapid uh, development of, of digital and AI, and I think it's been acknowledged that something had to be done. And, and uh, apart from sort of the information uh, and how you manage that and disinformation, I think one of the worrying things that has been noticed is sort of the, uh, the, the sort of lack of concentration, behavioral changes, and I think we should also pay attention to the human side, not only information. And, and at the moment, there's a huge discussion about what should we do in Finland to do ban mobile phones during the school time, uh, not give you know, iPads to all the kids, uh, and, and I'm not always in favor of, of regulating or, or banning things, but. Clearly, uh, something has happened that is sort of a little bit out of control. We've seen a lot of uh, unfortunate increase of, of uh, violence by, in schools by young kids, uh, uh, also in the streets, uh, and, and often apparently uh, as a result of having seen a lot of, uh, you know, terrible uh, videos. Or, or, or so so um, I think that's something also we need to pay attention, not only to the disinformation, but also the behavioral changes, the lack of concentration. Maybe the, the Slovenians have a, a better success there, how to deal with the education system. Yeah. FRA hasn't dealt so much, but we are setting up a youth program, uh, exactly because we also need to be able to communicate and work with youth and, and all, all these issues. So. Right before jumping to Slovenian uh, sample, like you reminded me that there was a panel uh, a couple of months ago on TikTok. And everyone was super shocked that the only country which were extremely resilient to the disinformation on TikTok was Finland because of the educational system, which teaches young people from the early age. Uh, so uh, answering the question, when it's good to start media literacy, it's not at the university, it's not in the high school, it's not even a gymnasium, you should start from the kindergarten. And in such way, uh, you empower your younger generation to make better choices, and you're not afraid of technology, which is there in front of them. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Emilia, so like answering the question from David, and maybe some uh, Slovenian perspective on it. Thank you so much. I will answer this question as a mother, not as a minister. Uh, I have, uh, he will be 10 year old uh, this year. So I had a great subject in high school. Uh, it was called theory of knowledge. And I had an amazing professor. Uh, we were questioning ourselves about everything, even whether the grass is really green or uh, I'm the uh, daughter of my parents and uh, somebody didn't uh, change me in the hospital. So. 
at that subject, I learned that I always have to check, 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 check. And this is something I want to teach my uh, son. So as mentioned earlier, I'm using artificial intelligence daily. And uh, everybody knows that, my son knows that, and he's also using artificial intelligence, some chatbots and so on, but he knows that he should never trust her, she, uh, her, uh, him, or it. <laughs> so uh, that always has to check. And critical thinking, I think it's the best way how we can deal with artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, uh, in Slovenia, we don't have the schooling system like you do uh, in uh, Finland. Uh, we are looking towards it. Uh, we have a lot of discussions uh, with the colleagues there as well. And I think it's crucial what you said. Uh, it's not, we should not start in high school. Mm -hmm. It was great for me that I had this subject in high school, but we should start in the kindergarten. And even we have somebody with authority that tells us something, we should never, never really trust him or her, but we should always verify whether it is the truth. It's Thank actually you. very refreshing uh, being in a democratic country and hearing from a minister, like cabinet level, saying like, you should never trust 100% someone from authority, only you should check. I think this is a good, the best advice uh, a responsible politician and a minister can give to his uh, or her people. Uh, thank you so much for that, Stephanie. Moving to you, uh, answering David's question and uh, adding maybe to your twist on your job, uh, public diplomacy, you have thousands and thousands of people all over the world uh, coming in different programs, uh, you know, which, which are run by the State Department. Um, I, I bet uh, they have the common denomination, this seek for knowledge, how we can use that in order to, uh, you know, send out uh, this message of collaboration across borders? Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the question. Um, excellent keynote listening. Um, so I, I want to start, too, uh, by, uh, by noting that I have a five-and-a-half-year-old and a, a three-and-a-half-year-old, and both of them know how to use my phone. They know how to use the iPad. Um, so, uh, to the point that my five and a half year old is using tablets for her math classes at school, right? Like, so I'm, I'm heartened um, that those things are starting early in our education system. The other thing that I've observed as well, um, and again, I would put this in the category as probably necessary but not sufficient, um, a group of parents sort of like organizing themselves, right, to talk about their kids' social media usage or um, or how to read and, um, and analyze information, really at the kindergarten, sort of like first and second grade levels, right? And this is coming out of the Surgeon General, Surgeon General Murphy's recent reports on, on, this, particular, um, on this particular issue. So in lieu of um, you know, some of the things that, um, that other panelists talked about in terms of sort of like you know, no phone usage at school and what have you, parents are sort of taking these things into their own hands. Um, from a professional standpoint, you know, so much of what uh, we do at the State Department and with our, you know, global public diplomacy team of, you know, 5,000 professionals around the world who are engaging people day in and day out with media literacy programs, with English language programs that hopefully allow people access to, um, you know, factual, unbiased information, um, those things are all fundamental to what we do, right? And our hope is that by building networks and supporting networks like EDI, like other programs, like the Young African Leaders Initiative, some of our other youth programs, we're building a network of people who can learn from each other, who can um, sort of check each other in terms of some of these narratives and what have you. I would point to, for instance, the Digital Communications Network which um, you know, exists in Europe, uh, in, uh, in Latin America, um, in East Asia Pacific, in Africa. This is an organization um, that the State Department supports but is, is self-sustaining. And uh, to the point that you know, we, our initial uh, cohort of alumni included very influential people in Ukraine. And so following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, those individuals, because they had such a powerful connection and such a network, organized themselves to push back on Kremlin disinformation that was infiltrating you know, their country. So, and that to me, like that's, that's the real power, right? When we're able to support a group of people like that and then they turn and they organize themselves around an issue that they feel passionately about, that is, that's the ball game. That's what we wanna do every day. 
Fantastic. Uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I've been so much inspired up until this moment. So many nice quotes, and as a spokesperson, I, I definitely know what can make a news. And you were newsmakers today, you know, headline after headline, idea after an idea. You know, uh, I'm looking forward to be getting a copy of the recording. Hopefully the technical team will be helping uh, later on. But now it's the most important uh, part of the, today's conversation. We are adding beautiful people who attended this session to it, uh, because the democratic process is when everyone is participating. Thank you, David, for uh, starting up. Now the floor is open for everyone. Anyone who have a question, please identify yourself, uh, raise your hand if you wish to address uh, the speakers. It can be uh, someone particular or uh, everyone. Dear panelists, let's keep the answers as short as possible, if possible. Hello. Hello, my name is Bram van Lieset. I'm the deputy ambassador of, of uh, Nisosemska in the Netherlands. Um, and the subtitle says it a bit, but uh, I've got a feeling that we're very much on the defensive side of using the digital age at this moment, if we're talking about democracy. Um, and I'm wondering, because I'm from the hybrid generation that grew up first without internet and the digital age, and then now we're totally in it. High five. Um, yeah, and now with young children as well, I'm wondering how can we do that in a good way? And I would first say we're not start starting at kindergarten, we're starting the very first day at home, uh, because of course here as well, everybody's listening, but also checking their email and the WhatsApp. Um, so also with a little baby in your hand, keep that phone away. Um, but I'm missing kind of the element, how we use the digital age in a positive way to strengthen democracy. Um, and also me, like, also if I look at the Netherlands, we've been involved in projects, how to involve people in policy decisions using digital tools. And I think also if we look at examples in other countries, it's always very poor if it comes from governments. Uh, it's always just let's use a tool on social media, but not how we organize ourselves. I hear um, uh, one, one of the speakers say that there, we should organize some kind of environments where we can organize ourselves. But uh, Emilia, if I can ask you as a minister as well, um, especially if, if we look at Slovenia as a country with a small population, uh, I think there is a lot, of, um, a lot of opportunities, so to say, because also if I look at a country as Estonia, I'm from a small country myself as well, of course, but um, they are really thinking about how we use digital tools to strengthen our democracy. And I'm wondering if Slovenia, especially with the current government, who is very big on reforms, if, if there is a perspective uh, where you want to uh, use it in a positive way. And I'm also saying this, and then I'm going to end, because I'm sounding like a real diplomat with a lot of, lot of words right now. <laughs> but uh, because if we're talking about the defense side, we're looking at China and Russia. And of course, a lot of people here think they're doing everything wrong, but one procedural way they're doing right is that they have a long-term vision that we definitely... Uh, are lacking in the EU, I would say, partly, uh, but definitely on the national side as well. And uh, not talking about the political content they are actually putting there, but I feel like we should have a positive long-term agenda to put it uh, at balance, actually, against those big powers. So, Emilia, if I can give you the word, word for that. Thank you so much. And because we have uh, a few time before we end the session, I will take a couple of more questions. So you just take note of those which were addressed. Who else wants, maybe from this part of the hall, address a question, just to make sure that we were very inclusive? Anyone? Okay, if not, we are very thankful to everyone who, um, you know, was engaged. By the way, uh, you gave me so much energy, like I was watching you and, you know, it gave me lots of confidence in moderating today's session. So, uh, my good job is based on your good job there, so thank you. So, let's pass, uh, so if you could all comment briefly on the question from the audience and you, Emilia, particularly, if you can start, please. Thank you so much, it's amazing remark. And uh, if you remember, I started that uh, the role of the government is to make sure that democracy thrives in the digital age. Yes. And I agree, usually we speak about the threats, but there are so many good things, so many opportunities that digital technologies can bring. Access to information, 
as never before we, we hadn't have so much access to knowledge information like we do now in the digital age. Then transparency. And this is something that the Slovenian uh, government is paying a lot of attention. We have an open data portal. You can find everything about the government spending, the uh, employment of the people that are in the government, the fluctuations, everything is already there. How the budget is spending and so on and so on. Uh, then uh, Slovenia, uh, for those who don't know, was the first country in the world that started a project with the OECD uh, about uh, like a public stewardship. So every each ministry uh, has a, a stewardship, data stewardship, uh, and we want to make sure that everybody understands how they can use data. Uh, then another thing uh, that uh, we can do is participatory budgeting, for example. Uh, in Slovenia, we already have a lot of municipalities that are using these tools. We would like to introduce such tools for the governmental budgeting, uh, at least some piloting way. So there are many things. Unfortunately, we don't have like systematic approach to it, but we are trying to uh, introduce with, the, the, with such positive examples as well. So for me personally, transparency is the best way how we can deal uh, with uh, the, uh, democracy and how we can make sure that uh, democracy thrives. Thank you so much. Please, Moira. I can give you just a taste literally just a taste of like my past week um, to give you an example of just how much these tools are being used by democratic actors around the world to make positive change and that it's being driven by civil society, not by governments. And that is, for instance, uh, the students in Bangladesh asked us to prioritize digital rights and keeping the internet open because that's what's going to make them trust their election. Uh, if they and when they, they help make it happen. So we saw that request. Uh, and they will be using participatory democracy tools like we see out of Stanford, Decidim, other tools like that to be able to determine how they're going to create an internet governance system that they can trust. Uh, we uh, see our partners in Belarus, with New Belarus, that have connected the, those who are displaced from Belarus right now so they can maintain a connection and that their duly elected government has a voice and can have a conversation with them. Uh, our partners in Taiwan use chatbots and tools to elevate issues through participatory democracy tools that if they reach a certain threshold, the parliament is required to pay attention to it and to entertain it. Highly recommend get to know Taiwan if you haven't. The digital system is, it's, you know, I'll see your Estonia and I'll raise you a Taiwan um, in terms of, of how they do it. Um, and uh, we're, we're helping to, in, in Kenya, they're going through a digitalization process, and we're helping them to rethink some of the tools that they're using for uh, persons with disabilities, because simple things like CAPTCHA aren't accessible to many populations. And so they've got to really think deliberately about how they're going to do that so that they include the most vulnerable. Um, so those are just, oh, and Morocco, fix my road. Um, they developed a system where they can alert the government and the government is working with them. But it's real key that the government has to partner and meet civil society where it is in order for these systems to work. So there's a lot happening out there and what we experience is that sometimes you have well-intentioned groups that need the technical know-how. So there are a lot of opportunities for donor governments to jump in and help facilitate that with the expertise that you have in your own countries. Fantastic. Stephanie, if I can go to you now. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. So absolutely, there's opportunity here. It's not, it's not just risk. It's not just all doom and gloom. For us at the State Department, we reach hundreds of, of thousands uh, of people around the world through, through our social media platforms. Um, and that includes you know, directly engaging uh, Russians in Russia through the department's first ever Telegram channel. Um, it includes... Um, you know, our embassies and consulates around the world pushing out, um, you know, messaging again to Amelia's point about transparency, right? So as I said earlier, there's no ambiguity about United States government policy with respect to a particular issue. Um, I should note too that there's absolutely opportunity for us internally, and we've been using AI, generative AI, um, to save upwards of 180,000, uh, you know, in staff time annually with respect to media monitoring, right? We very much believe that if you're not using AI right now, you're already behind, right? And so we are thinking about ways that we can continue to be on the forefront. The State Department has done an excellent job here, and in terms of the United States government, I think is really a leader and at the forefront um, of how the, the government is thinking about artificial intelligence. Thank you. Nikolai, please. 
Yeah, real quick, one concrete example of how I think we helped strengthen a democracy in um, elections context again, just to, to be very concrete. If you take the example of EU elections, um, we actually made sure that first we were compliant with uh, DSA guidelines, and in order to do that, we were making sure that all political parties were getting the same access to our tools, to our solutions, same understanding of how it works, so that then they could actually take their message to citizens, to voters, with the same capabilities. And, you know, we do actually send one voter information unit to every user on Facebook, one election day reminder to every voter, every user on Facebook in the days before the elections. And we make sure, by the way, that the voter information um, unit is actually linked to the website of the local um, uh, election commission in that market. So a lot of work, as you can imagine, to make sure that these informations were in the right language, getting to the users at the right time. But I think it's an example of strengthened democracy. Also, you know, going back to the idea of transparency, being able to actually look at all the messages, all the campaigns from all the parties at a given time when an election is running to understand who's actually pushing which message. I think that's also democracy strengthened. Thank you. Uh, Serpa, very quickly, if you could comment on that. But the short is possible. I think the positive agenda also comes with human rights. Uh, I agree at the moment there's a very strong focus on security. It can become easier to defense if we may allow our, ourselves to be ruled too much by fear. I think we still have to continue to work on open societies, democracy, working with civil society, and I think human rights, human rights are part of that. Uh, it's not the panacea, but it's very much part of that. Thank and you. it's a positive message. Yes. Nicholas, I started with you, and I'm ending this conversation with you. Thank you. What would be your take on that? Well, I think whilst it's important to be positive, it's been very important to acknowledge the danger of the current situation. And this has forced me to rethink the whole issue of reputation for, for nations. And I think that the instability of publics, the vulnerability of publics to disruption in digital space is a national security problem. And that's why I now I no longer talk about soft power as a frame. I talk about reputational security because this is about the survival of small countries. This is, this is what was lacking for Ukraine in 2014, and it's what they have built in the subsequent years, so that when the awful thing happened in 2022, they would get a different result. I believe that through digital technology, the central issue of Stephanie's work, public diplomacy, has changed from the old style question of what can I say to convince you to who can I empower to help you and to bring us together in digital tools enable us to do that. And the examples of uh, the, how Ukraine was able to act so decisively in 2022 had a lot to do with people who'd been empowered, uh, like uh, Yevhen Fedchenko, founder of Stop Fake. You know, this, this was a community project where donors from around our community had put money into the development of an important part of um, a, a, a counter disinformation media e ecology. So I think we need to connect. We need to think about not only our own reputational security as nation states, but our collective reputational security as democracies. Not only should we think about media literacy, but media development and digital media development. So we're not only empowering and we're not only uh, engaging and exposing, but we're also creating the kind of free and uh, media with integrity that is you're talking about emerging in Moldova. My case of a digital difference is 2018 in Yerevan, where uh, a, a civil society project called Sivnet and a state-funded project, Radio Free Europe Armenian Service, were able to live stream protests happening in the streets. So there was no way that the government 
could say it wasn't happening. Everybody could see it. And that is a great example of the digital making a democratic transformation possible. And just one point to end on is that a lot of this all comes down to listening. Yes. So I'm so glad there was a plenary listener here because this is the fundamental and often forgotten dimension of democracy. Historically, thanks to whatever it is, the Greek tradition, everybody talks about freedom of speech. Nobody talks about obligation to listen. And often we have to listen to people who are not saying things that make us comfortable. But we, that is our, and there are so many tools in the digital realm that make it possible to listen as never before, including artificial intelligence tools. And so for me, that is the foundation of my optimism regarding the digital and the democratic, is that we can correct this big error that happened way back in the distant past of making democracy all about talking and start to make it maybe where it always should have been, about the power of us listening to each other. Fantastic. Let's have, give you a round of applause. So Nicholas, Nikolai, Serpa, Emilia, Stephanie, Moira, you are fantastic today. Let's give all of them a round of applause. It would have been possible with, uh, without you. So you also deserve a round of applause from our speakers and from yourself. And finally, uh, I would like to end uh, this session by taking a joint selfie. It's a digital world, so I invite all of you to participate in it. Uh, so people who are in this area over here, if you could come closer. Uh, of course, if someone does not, does not feel uh, okay being in the forum, it's fine. But those who want to be part of that, please come here closer. We're going to take a joint selfie together with our panelists, uh, just to have a nice memory of the session today. You can come closer to the, to the stage.